Dave Scott, and uh, these gentlemen are with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is, of all places, located in Butte. But uh, Dave farms just outside of uh, Whitehall, right? And has a, a what used to be a, a dairy that he turned into a sheep operation. So he's going to talk a little about kind of both of those items. Okay. I'm really glad to be here today with you. And, and uh, when I look out with you guys, uh, I'm reminded that it seems like only yesterday that I was in class just like this too. But it's really been 40 years. So. Um, what I wanted to just visit with you a little bit about today, during today, was uh, the changes that have happened on our farm and uh, the challenges that we kind of met and how we tried to react to those, to those challenges. Uh, one thing I'd like to uh, say before we go any further is uh, please, uh, please ask questions um, because uh, I'm trying today to do my little bit the best I can to, to uh, share some information with you. And if, if you have a question about what I'm saying and you don't ask it, then then I'm failing in that regard. And also, you guys keep me on track, too. So please ask questions if you have, have any at all. Um, I went to school at, at WSU in, in uh, the early 70s, and I was just very passionate about dairy farming, although I, I, when I grew up, I grew up in the city, and uh, I just love dairy cows. So everything I did pretty much revolved around a dairy cow. And at WSU, uh, we were taught that production per cow was everything. And that was kind of in the 70s, that pretty much was the mantra. And that uh, your costs would take care of themselves. And that's one of the things that's really changed in agriculture over the years, is costs are a very big item. So anyway, when we started our farm, we bought a hay field out in Whitehall in 1982. And uh, I had had about five years of experience as a uh, dairy uh, herdsman in western Washington on a herd of registered Guernsey's cows. And on that herd, too, the owner stressed production. So it was just natural for me to start this farm, and we were going to produce milk, lots of milk for cow. And so this hay field, I looked at it, and I thought, well, we'll just produce hay. That's the way I knew to, to produce lots of milk. So that was 1982, and the plan worked fine for about two months. And in June, we cut our hay really nice hay. And Montana has excellent hay, too, by the way. It's very high quality. Dairies from around the United States seek out Montana hay. Uh, what happened to us was... <coughs> am I going the right way? Yeah. First thing we had to figure out was how we are going to harvest it. <coughs> we were too small. We had 50 cows. Too small to buy equipment. That was obvious. And we had, then we had to figure out, well, who's going to put it up? So we got some people, local farmers, to put it up for us. And uh, then there's the labor of picking up bales. In those days, we didn't have a, a harrow bed or anything, so we had to pick up bales. And as my wife told me many times afterwards that you're not Superman, you cannot milk cows twice a day and, and hay at the same time. And it's generally true. Um, but our biggest problem that we ran into in June was it rained. It rained for six weeks off and on, and so by the time our, what once was a very nice stand of alfalfa in the bud, turned out to be basically straw. And so, uh, it was quite a disappointment. That's what you're up against when, when you're putting up hay or any stored feed, is the weather. You've got to take into account the weather, and it's always a uh, unknown. So, we, that winter, we were kind of thinking things over, and we realized we had to do something different. And the weather, you know, uh, taking account for the change in weather and everything was our biggest priority. So we ran into a, uh, right way. 
an article in the Hortz Dairyman. How many people have ever read the Hortz Dairyman at all? Anybody? Yeah, okay, great. It, just on a little plug for the dairy industry, if you want to know what is the, the forefront of anything in livestock, just follow the dairy industry. They're usually two or three steps ahead of uh, cattle and sheep in terms of new ideas and new things. Well, this was in 1982, and Cornell was just doing some promoting and studying uh, what they called at that time rational grazing. And what they were trying to figure out was the problem with dairy farmers in New York going broke over stored, sealed, sealed stored systems. It's like harvest stores, you ever seen those big blue silos? Well, they're a great idea, but they cost an awful lot. And people were going broke using them. So Cornell came up with the idea of short duration grazing. And the biggest thing that was driving it was it could produce high quality dairy feed at a low cost. So when I read this article in the Horse Dairy, I thought, man, this is what we need. So we set out to try it, and whoops. what we found out was that it is cheaper by quite a bit. You're basically, your, your equipment, you might say, is just poly wire fence. And there, we basically had three rolls of poly wire, which probably cost $300, and then we just moved the cows uh, every milking, which would be twice a day, to a new pasture. So our 30 acres had, had about 40 pastures in it, and then we had a little bit left over uh, for heifers and stuff. Um, we also found out that, that this new system, I don't know, how many have ever heard of management intensive grazing? Okay, well this is basically that. Management intensive grazing just was another point of uh, term coined by Jim Garish, he's in Idaho right now. But it's gone through several names, short duration grazing, rational grazing, intensive grazing, management intensive grazing. There's probably three or four other ones too. But this whole system works well with irrigation. What we did was we followed the, the cows every day with, we had tan lines at that time, we'd follow them right along with the cows and then we'd always be three days ahead of the cows with irrigation too. So. It's an intensive type system that you have to integrate your grazing with your, with your uh, irrigation, but it works. It works very well. We had uh, feed that we produced was around 25% crude protein, and the TDN was pretty much always in the 65, 66% range. So it supported dairy cows. Our harvesting costs were just about nothing because we went and let the cows do it happy cows, and the biggest thing probably that it worked for us was it took the guesswork out of the weather. We were hardly ever <clears throat> unable to go harvest the feed with the cows. When it rained an inch and a half, maybe overnight, yes, we were off to pasture because they'd trump them too bad. But, so this system really worked for us, and, and over the years that we had the dairy, we just kind of constantly tweaked it a little bit so that in the year 2003, when we ended up selling the cows, largely because our two kids went to college, and there was no workforce gone, um, we, uh, we had a system so that it, we would run 50 cows and 25 bred heifers on about 25 acres, and then four acres were out basically every year for a new seed. So it was a lot of cattle on a small postage type farm, but it worked. And we made money during the summer and kept our heads above water during the winter when we bought it. Yeah. <coughs> so, Dave, um, about how many months out of the year could you graze? We grazed the first of May generally, maybe a week earlier, maybe the last week in April. Not going to happen this year, probably, unless we get a lot of sunshine really fast. But we would turn out the cows when the grass was eight inches high, approximately, and we grazed through the month of August. So. Four months, then in the, the month of September, we let the grass rest so it would build root reserves up in the roots so it could make it through the winter. And then about after we had three hard frosts, usually by the middle of uh, October, we graze again. 
So we had, and that gave us, with that amount of cattle on the ground, on the land there, it gave us about three more weeks. So we probably had almost five months, not quite, generally. And then where did the feed for your, when you were not grazing, where did that come from? We bought all our hay. Oh, okay. Everything that we, we didn't produce any feed for the winter at all. Then uh, we did have a few problems with it, though. The biggest one was weeds. And this isn't the kind of weeds we had. We, we specialized in lamb's quarters, kochia, uh, red stem fennel, and pigweed. And all those weeds came from, you guessed it, the local uh, elevator where we buy our barley. The first 10 years of the farm, uh, we just spread the manure from the winter out on the ground, and uh, it was a great source of nutrients for the soil. However, it did manage to plant enough or get enough weed seed out there in that ground so that every time we made a new seed, plowed it up and got it ready and planted it, we had about 20 pounds to the acre of those weeds come up too. It, uh, so it was, it was huge, and um, it, they just pretty much really uh, made the new seeding hard to establish. So what we, uh, and the problem with it is we couldn't spray it because we had grass clover mix in the new seeding, so we had both monocots and dicots, and so we'd spray one spray, we'd kill the grass, spray the other, put weeds, and we'd kill the clover in it, or the alfalfa. So we were kind of at a dilemma, and what we did was we decided to compost. And composting kills all the weed seeds at about 135 degrees. There's a saying in the dairy industry that life begins at 40 degrees and life ends at 135 to 140 degrees. Meaning that bacteria in your milk will start growing at 40 degrees. Seed stops growing or seed stops living at 140. So what we do is uh, this compost uh, process takes about 10 months, but it's turned over several to say 10 times, and each time it gets up to 140 degrees, we turn it. Uh, we have a big, long three-foot thermometer, and we monitor that daily. At first, it takes only about two to three days to reach uh, 140 degrees, and then it gradually takes longer and longer. But what we end up with is a nice long window of compost that's extremely high in bacteria and protozoa for our soil. That's a very large uh, benefit of it. And we've also managed to kill all the, all the kochia, lamb's quarters, and various other weed seeds in it. So now when we're spreading that compost out on, the, on our fields, we've kind of taken a step forward in not producing <coughs> or spreading any more of those weed seeds. Yeah? How much weed intensive is it to do that, to collect all the I guess you're just collecting manure now, or? Yeah, we're collecting bedding, the yeah. straw that we use for bedding, and then the manure. So it kind of it gets collected all during the winter, and then in the springtime, we make these long windrows with a, a manure spreader and a skid loader. So you, you just move the spreader <clears throat> slowly, and you add to, to it. You, what we generally do for our farm is is two, one and a half to scoop of straw to uh, one scoop of manure. It all varies kind of on the consistency of the manure and how much urine and, and manure is in with the straw. But it took us about three years to figure out that combination, just trial and error. But now we can pretty much get it down so we have a nice product when we end up with it. So we, in the dairy, when we had the dairy, we had about 500 yards of compost generated every year. <clears throat> that means we started with a thousand yards because it shrinks to a half by the time it composts. So what we did was uh, it builds organic matter. It's like a yogurt culture for soil, basically. It just puts tons of nice uh, thousands, probably millions of different kinds of soil bacteria and protozoa that you're applying with this compost. And also there's something to sell. And if you're a farmer, that's what you're always looking for is something to sell. We generally sell about half, half of our compost. <clears throat> it goes out in pickup loads mainly. Uh, we generally sell about 
200 yards a year. And so that's almost $5,000 that is added income to us. And I really like making compost because what you start with, you know, just a pile of old straw <coughs> and a pile of manure here that really isn't that, that uh, appetizing, you end up with a pile of compost that smells like your Galton Valley soil, right? Black dirt. It's just really a nice product. <clears throat> so that is one other thing that <clears throat> our farm has evolved through is, and this we've done it for about 20 years now. And <clears throat> it, I would not farm with animals without a composting system. The biggest thing it does is it gives you peace of mind that you're not going to have weeds that you're planting every time you go out there with the manure spray. The uh, next thing that happened to us. In 2003, we, uh, we sold the dairy cows. We were kind of ready for a change. Uh, I had been involved in the dairy industry for 30 years by that time, and, and I think my wife was uh, ready to quit too. So what we realized that we really would never see our kids again if we kept milking cows, because they were at different places and much further than a five-hour leash that dairy cows give you. So we sold the cows, and we'd always had about 30 ewes, um, and we decided we'd go into the sheep business in a larger scale. So we bought 160 ewes, and so that put us about to 200 ewes. And everything, what we thought, we'd just run the pasture system just like we did at the dairy cows, because they produced very high quality forage, and so lambs probably would grow just like cows would milk. So we did that for three or four years, and I woke up one morning and I thought, man, what happens if the wormers that we're using cease to work? And I had read uh, just lately that, uh, or at that time, that in the southeast part of the United States now, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, they were having a lot of trouble with their lambs and goats uh, not responding to any of the current wormers that we have, and they still aren't. And so I thought, oh man, what's going to happen to us if uh, we can't raise lambs anymore because no wormers? And we were worming about three times during the summer. It was called strategic worming. Um, right when the about about every three weeks we would worm, and then we'd kind of taper off towards the end. <coughs> But it, it was working, I have to say that. But we'd gone through Valvazin and then Safeguard, and we were just beginning Ivermec. So Ivermec is the end of the road because there's nothing else, right, Pat, after that? It's pretty well covered. Yeah. So I, I thought, man, what's going to happen when Ivermec doesn't, use it, doesn't work anymore? And it's not working in the southeast and to a large extent now the northeast part of the United States. So, we kind of did some research, talked to people in those, that area of the country, uh, different sheep producers, and what we came up with, the common theme was <clears throat> that the sheep worm larvae, the brown stomach worm, is the biggest problem that we have out here. It has about a 20 to 22 day life cycle. So we started looking at our grazing, cycle, which is the amount of time that the, the grass is rested. So if you start at A on your pasture and you go all the way through and you get back to A again, the grazing cycle time or the rest period is that number of days. Well, it was happened to be 22 days. So we were putting the growth population curve of the larvae of the worms and our grazing day cycle, I mean, they were the same curve. So when the, the worm population was at its peak, that's when our sheep were right in that cell. So we thought, oh boy, I mean, we couldn't have really managed this better for growing a bunch of worms on our pasture than <laughs> if we tried. And so that was the first thing we thought, we gotta change that. So what we did is we backed off our cycle time in our pastures to 30 to 35 days. And what that does is the, the uh, worm population decreases pretty gradually, 
but significantly at about 28 days. So now we had our two curves offset on each other, and that has helped tremendously. The other thing that we found out was that the uh, brown stomach worm larvae, they only travel up about two to three inches on the grass plant itself that's grazed. So we thought, well, we'll just limit our, our uh, height of the stubble and when we take the lambs off the field to five inches. And that should, that should make some allowance there and we'll see if that work, works. And so we put those two practices into play the following summer with the additional one of uh, we delayed the irrigation for two days after the uh, sheep were in the pasture. And we have, now we have little tiny tin pivots, and so we are able to uh, pretty easily uh, manage our irrigation scheduling without a lot of labor. So we wait two days after the sheep are in the grazing cell, and then we irrigate. But you can do it with hand lines, wheel lines, it really doesn't matter. You can do it with flooding too, it's a little bit harder to control in the flood system. But the other thing that we do do now is we really select hard for, uh, for lambs that uh, look wormy. You know, they have, you take their eyeball, their eyelid, and they, they have a very white color. You know, they look halfway anemic, um, and they just don't do well. So when we do weaning weights in the summer, in about the first week in July, those lambs that don't gain, their mothers are going to billings that fall. So we're trying to gradually select, a, you know, for a, an animal in our flock that will have some tolerance to, to parasites. Yeah, Dan? Hey, what does <laughs> irrigation do to that, that worm? Does, does it have any impact or when they travel up the stem or does it not affect them at all, the water and pasture? You know, I don't know. One thing I do know is though with uh, the hot summer days, and a sprinkle type mist irrigation that if you get on a pivot, it makes it humid. And especially in that micro um, ecology there and the, you know, the first several inches of that grass, it's really humid there. And it's just perfect for, for parasites to increase in. I don't know though uh, what that irrigation, if it washes it down or, or what. Um, what would you think? I don't know. I was just, uh, yeah. I, I'm really excited. I'd really like to have some means to uh, measure how much parasite we do have on that grass and then also correlate that with measuring how much are in our fecal, uh, the lamb themselves. It would be a very nice study. Something that MSU could do someday, maybe. I'd provide the lambs. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, though, on that, when we're trying to keep our stubble height at five inches, there's no other way you can do that without intensive grazing. It's impossible. Because if you put your, your cattle or your sheep out on a, on a cell, a grazing cell, and you come back a week later, there's going to be parts of that cell that the animals have eaten first. Because they just like that part of the cell. The ground's different, or the plants are different, or something. And so they eat it, they'll eat it down to two inches, and then they'll go eat to the second most part that they like. And then three days later, they'll go back to that first part that they, they like. So by the end of your week there, you've got a field that looks like a uh, billiard uh, table on parts of it, and then on other parts, they're about this big cell. So if you don't leave them in for a short duration time, like one day seems to be about the right amount of time, any more than one day, you can't control what those animals are eating. So, um, this is why it was just, it worked with our intensive grazing system, and I don't think it would work otherwise. You can't control it. So, people that are uh, saying, well, I'm going to control my parasites by uh, just changing a lot of pastures, but I'm still going to leave them in there for a week, it's not going to work. You've got to be able to control the height of your grass when you go out of the pasture. So the, the uh, thing that happened was we, we noticed in the next year and the following years, um, we've been doing this for about four years now, and we take weaning weights, all the lambs in the 10th of July usually, about that time, 
and our weaning weight average daily gain increased from 0.60 to 0.69. Now that doesn't seem like too much, but when you add that over 400 lambs, over and then over a, a 60 days, then it adds up to about several pounds per lamb per day, which is significant when you're only producing a lamb that weighs 90 pounds anyway at market. We saved $1,200 in wormer alone, plus all the labor that it took to worm the lambs. It usually takes a long afternoon, meaning you get done about 9 o'clock at night. Um, do it, and we were doing it three and sometimes four times a summer. So that labor is out the window. Plus, the peace of mind that we're working, we're, we're solving the problem using nature instead of an added input that we're really not too sure about is going to be viable in the future. So we kind of have a uh, uh, sense that since we're using, the, managing the grass and managing the animals without putting any added inputs in, this thing's going to work for a while, probably a long time. And so you can sleep at night that way, not worrying about uh, your parasites anymore. And that's something that we really are grateful for. Yeah? So how big are your paddocks that you're running? Our paddocks, we put generally 200 to 230 ewes. And well, last year it was 200 ewes, and we had about 370 lambs on that paddock, and they generally are two-thirds of an acre for one day. It kind of varies in the field because some parts of the field don't have the grass protection that other parts do. So it's basically what we aim for is one day gra uh, grazing period in that cell. Yeah? Um, how, uh, how easy do you think it would be to apply this type of warming procedure to uh, another, another system like... Another species? Another species like cattle or horses or... Very easy. You can do exactly the same thing. Um, cattle aren't as susceptible to, uh, to parasites in general as uh, sheep are, or lambs are especially. However, um, when we had the dairy heifers, uh, once in a while we got a cranky old heifer that we couldn't get wormed. And she stood out there all summer long as if she had fluorescent orange painted on her. You, know, you could just see her. She was unthrifty. And uh, so, but if you applied this system, I'm fairly certain that you could uh, have the same result. You know, the biggest thing is keeping that stubble five inches high and keeping your rotation grazing cycle so that it doesn't just completely overlap the cycle of the worm, the parasite. Yeah, Pat. Then one other thing, most of these parasites, if it's a sheep parasite, it's not a cow parasite. Yeah. So you can literally go in and consume that sheep parasite with a cow uh, and vice versa. So uh, not that that's, you know, there's, there's issues with fencing costs and all that sort of thing, but in a lot of cases you see sheep producers that do own <coughs> cattle. If you kind of have a pasture rotation in mind with parasite control being one of your major, major objectives, then you can use expert species grazing parasite management. Yeah, it really does work because we have, we still have dairy heifers, uh, a few of them, and we don't worm the dairy heifers anymore, and they just, they're in perfect shape. So, yeah, it really it is good system. Yeah? How did you extend the rotation period? Did you add more paddocks? Good question. I was hoping somebody answer that, would ask that. That's a very good question, and that's one of the first things we had to try to figure out to do. The only thing that you can do is either You've got to uh, decrease your amount of animals on a given area, or else have more ground. Right? So if you're going to go from a, a cycle time of 20 days to like 30. And what we did, we were fortunate, is we were running those 200 ewes and their offspring on 20 acres. And then we had about four acres out for new seeding every year, and another four acres out that we just let grow, uh, so it was about this high. And uh, when we weaned the lambs about the middle of July, we turned our now dry ewes out there in that pasture. And so it was just perfect for trying to slow down milk production, and uh, it gave you know, us a, a chance to increase that. So what we did is we, is 
we negated that uh, that pasture that was this high and used in our systems around. So we, we basically just increased our acreage. When now, when we're trying to increase our youth, youth block a little more, uh, we have to get a little more creative. And the thing that we've done is uh, we've shipped our use out uh, in middle of July, very beginning of August, to uh, uh, target graze spurge on neighboring ranches. So that takes a lot of pressure off our home pastures at home, which is another great thing if you're running sheep. It's wide open. The demand is out there from eating weeds to just having a landowner who appreciates some animals on their ground to look at. And a lot of times they'll do it. They won't charge you anything. They just want to see the pretty picture out there. So there's opportunity out there for a bunch of creative solutions if you don't have enough land like ourselves. Hey, would you just review again on your sheet? So you have 200 to 230 ewes. You end up with 370 lands. Just how many acres and uh, how long you graze and how long you feed? Yeah, we, we generally run about a 200% lambing average. Um, that's including the ewe lambs. So our mature ewes have about 230%, which all translates into lots of bumps. We generally run, raise about 60 to 80 bums a year, and so far we have not figured out a way to graze uh, orphan bums on our pasture. They need a mother to show them how to eat, for one thing, and just they just seem to be more susceptible to parasites for some reason. And so we pretty much just feed our bums hay. So actually what we're going out there with our pastures with is about 200 ewes, and 350 approximately lambs. And we're doing that on 30 acres. And we're doing that from about May 1 to the 10th or 15th of July. And by that time, those lambs are averaging about 65, 67 pounds a piece. And when they get to 60 pounds, folks, they really start eating grass. And so our grass just starts to disappear ahead of the the flock and our system starts breaking down. So that at that point, we wean the lambs, ship the ewes out to eat weeds on another place, and then we have lots of pasture to feed the lambs. In fact, we have so much pasture that we stockpile the pasture during parts of that pasture during August and September, and then we graze that in the month of October, November, December. Through February, we can raise enough winter feed by taking the ewes out there, out of the pasture. Did that answer that? Kind yeah, of? I think so. So you can end up, so you take your ewes out in July. Right. And when do they come back? They come back about the middle of October. And then you can graze those ewes till about February. Right. We can graze them on our own pastures then till the middle of February. We have plenty of grass. Actually, we had more grass than we needed this February, but it'll be it'll be eight this summer. And our plan is, our hope is that as we get more use, we'll just hopefully find more land over owners that we can ship the use out to in August and to until October. Uh, the other thing that we really uh, kind of were surprised with, it was just a fortunate set of circumstances that the fact that we can now tell customers at our farmer's markets that we go to that these lambs are wormer free and our restaurants that we go to that we sell our lamb to in Bozeman and Big Sky and Twin Bridges and a few in Butte, uh, it, they like that. They want to have the closest they can to something that has no, no antibiotics, no hormones, and no wormers. And, We'd always been able to say no antibiotics and no hormones in our lamb, but now we can say no hormones too. And that builds customer appreciation for your product and also trust. And it translated into a nice thing for us that increased our lamb direct market sales. And that's the last thing I'd like to uh, talk about is what we evolved into pretty much just by pressure. Uh, it's really nice just to get your lambs together in August and put them on a truck and wave bye-bye and get the check two days later. I mean, that's, the, that's a really nice uh, way to do it. It's easy. 
but the problem with us was is uh, not enough money. So um, we had a even though our system is highly pretty highly productive in its grass production and its lamb production, we still were looking around for pennies at the end of the year. So we decided to try to uh, do more of our own marketing and kind of take more things into our own hands. And what we found the trouble with marketing our livestock as a commodity is the first thing is commodities don't recognize high quality animals. And you might say, well, yeah, they do. I mean, if you're in the sale barn and you see a 50 set of 50 ewes or lambs come through the barn and they're like peas in a pod, they're all the same weight range, they're all the same conformation, they look terrific, they'll probably bring you $10 more a hundred weight. Well, that's great. And all the farmers and ranchers in the sale barn, they say, wow, look at that set of lambs. And you get home to with your check to the banker and he says, yeah, that's really nice, Dave, but you need $50 more, not 10 a hundred weight. So, commodity, sale barn markets, everything's pretty much the same. But if you're producing a premium product, you can get more for it by marketing it yourself. <clears throat> the other thing that's, that's tough to manage around commodities is they're always are fluctuating. They fluctuate from the months during the marketing season, like from June till December. Traditionally, prices for lambs were highest in June, and then they taper off all the way to December, and then they go up again in January if you want to feed your lambs that long. So you've got a lot of cost in there, too. And they also fluctuate from year to year. Generally, market lambs that are 90 pounds have been going for, say, $90. Um, in, like at the end of August. In 2012, they jumped up to $2.40 a pound. So it's a huge increase, and you might argue that it's a tremendous amount of bad things to the industry. But uh, the next year, 2013, they're back to $90 again. Nobody probably would have predicted that that I talked to. Nobody predicted the increase. Nobody predicted the huge fall again. So we were kind of hoping for $1.50 lambs. A uh, dollar, a dollar fifty a pound. Lambs last fall, we got eighty-five to ninety cents. So this, you just can never, you know, the common person can never really figure out what they're going to get for their product. If you direct market it, you can to a large degree, because if you produce a premium product that people want to keep buying, you can set your price, and they'll pay for it. Once your price gets too high and they start backing off, you've learned what they'll pay and what they won't. But your price can, in general, stay the same. Whether your costs are more, you can increase your price. And if they are less, you have the option to decrease your price. But you're kind of more in control. You're not kind of holding your hand out to the sale barn. Give me what you can give me. You know, you're, you're more in control of your own thing that way. And the other thing with commodities is they don't reflect your costs. Grain, barley is now $250, $260 a ton. Hay is upwards of $200 a ton. Price for your lambs last year is still $90. So it's a squeeze. But if you're, if you're setting your own costs by direct marketing, you can increase your costs that way. So direct marketing quality is rewarded. As long as you can produce a premium product, you're able to uh, charge a premium price for it. The other thing is uh, a direct marketing program can help to overcome your small scale advantage or disadvantage. And we are definitely small scale. Um, so we can, we can kind of overcome making maybe 10 to $20 a lamb at the sale barn with making almost $100 a lamb uh, if we direct market it. So it, it really does make a big difference in your bottom line and uh, something that we continue, we are planning on continuing doing. Um, so, any questions at all? Any more about direct marketing? Or, yeah? Do you market them as a whole lamb, like someone will come 
buy land and get it for cheap themselves, or do you have them butchered and then sell cuts? We do both. Generally, uh, all the lamb in the state of Montana has to be state inspected, so it has to go through a, uh, a state inspected plant. We're extremely lucky of having a state inspected plant, Montana's Best Meat, one mile down the road from us, um, which is another thing that's a huge, huge advantage. Um, we can put our hand on a lamb on the weekends, like say Saturday, and every week we pull out those lambs that are finished. How many kids are in, you guys are in 4-H, or were in 4-H? Any in livestock evaluation? Great, okay, well, I didn't know a thing about anything except dairy cows on livestock evaluation before. Our kids were in 4-H, and then I kind of got roped into being a livestock judging coach, and I'm so glad I did, because for nine years I had the benefit of being taught by some really good people on livestock evaluation, and I'm putting it to use right now on our lambs. Um, so it's a very important thing, but you can catch it, you can get it. Uh, evaluating your lambs, you know, we're shooting for two tenths of an inch of back fat, and I just run my hand across the back of that animal, uh, the legs, the shoulder area, and after you've done it for a while, you can tell what two tenths of an inch feels like. So we, we pull our lambs out every weekend, once a week, the ones that are finished, we take them Montana Best Meats that Monday, following Monday. The very next day, they're hanging, and that's our report card. We can see how well we judged they were finished. And it's a great system for uh, just keeping your hands in line. Yeah. So Dave, at two-tenths of an inch of back fat, what kind of variation do you see in your lambs in body weight or, or carcass weight? There's a lot. That we, we're, we have lambs that finish between uh, about 110 pounds and 160 pounds on the, on the hoof weight. Those ones that are heavier are, what we have is polypay ewes, which is a white face ewe. It's about 150, 160 pound mature weight ewe. And then we also have hemp uh, ewes, a few of them. But all, most all of our market lambs are a crossbred between a hemp, Texel, and these polypay ewes. So the polypase, if it's a straight polypay, whether it's a small framed animal, it's going to finish at 110 pounds. And then our crossbreds and straight bred hams, they'll finish in the 150 to 160 range. So we have quite a range. It kind of gives us a little bit of advantage because some of the customers want small chops, some want big chops. Uh, but we have found uh, through keeping pretty good records that we don't make a dime on a 110 pound lamb because our Processing cost of ninety dollars. It's a straight flat fee per lamb, and so that is pretty much gobbles up our profit. So what we're looking for is a hundred twenty-five to one hundred thirty-pound lamb average, and we are starting now to select for that in our in our use size and, and that sort of thing. So the other thing that's great about having a processing plant right down the road from you is tenderness of product. Um, Lamb can vary a lot. We didn't realize this, but as we got more involved with it, um, taste is a huge factor in the consumer, um, what they like and what they don't like. Lambs can taste kind of grassy and lamby, and they also can taste like cardboard. And one of the factors that influences that greatly is the amount of stress that that animal has before it goes to the process in transit. We're just really lucky that we have five minute time and lights are out. So there's no stress, so it really helps us a lot. I think we're about done, aren't we? Uh, really appreciate you guys and